I don't know if I have or not. So if you get really nervous, you're supposed to put your hands on your hips because it exudes confidence and see how your posture you know, kind of is up now. Whereas opposed, if you have your hands down, you tend to, you know, kind of squouch and the posture is bad. So. so if I have my power stance on, it, it's not that I'm trying to be overconfident, it's just I'm trying not to be nervous. So. Okay. So, um, like Gary mentioned, I'm, my name is Monica Cervantes. I'm currently with the company Wonderful Orchards. I'm actually a grad from CSUB from 2008. My background is as a business admin major with general business slash economics. This was before economics was its own kind of thing. There was a period in time where it was a concentration and then it came its own thing and then it came back. And somewhere in the middle, like my classes got mixed. There's neither here nor there because I'm in HR now. Um, and I bring this up more so because as you guys progress in your career, what you may have originally intended to go into may change over time. You, know, you get exposed to different stuff, you thought you loved accounting, and then you're like, this is all too much numbers, I wanna deal with people, this is not for me, and that's okay. So I have a list of questions that a lot of you guys have asked, so I'm gonna do my best to cover this. Mike, do you want to mention the name next to it too? I can turn that up and fix the name too. Okay. So, a lot of your guys' questions were geared towards kind of how I started my career out of college and how did I get into HR. So, I guess I describe myself as an accidental business professional. So, like, what, is that? what does that mean? You know? So, throughout college, I had your standard retail kind of job, so I wasn't fortunate enough to be in an internship where I knew business. So, you know, my first job was Panda Express, which I actually got by accident. I went to a career fair. I was overly enthusiastic. I showed up 7 a.m., but it didn't start till 8. So I was like, oh, I'm going to be the first one in line, have my resume ready. And uh, nobody was there, so I was sitting outside, and somebody else showed up. Didn't know who this person was, just made small talk. By eight o'clock, I found out that was the person who was actually hiring, and he offered me a job right then and there. So I was the first person there, got a job, was excited. No, first job, my mom wanted me to pay my car. I was not gonna have her nagging me anymore, so that's good. So and was I, this before graduation already? I can't, I can't this was in college, this okay. was in college. And I bring this up because some of you guys are gonna think, how do I relate what I currently do, whether you work retail or, or fast food or whatever, how are you gonna relate that to a job going outside of college? So this is why I'm kind of doing this preliminary okay. stuff. Um, after that, I worked at what was called JVX Grill, which was like a fancy jack-in-the-box. I don't know if ever, any of you guys have ever heard of that place at all? No. Yes. Yeah, JVX Grill. They were very overpriced hamburgers. They were like, before Carl's Jr. did like the five, six dollar burger, they had burgers that were like eight dollars. And I bring this up because there, that taught me a lot about sales. So, you know, this was like a fast food kind of hip restaurant, fast food. So we really took a lot of sales, customer service training classes. So kind of got a little bit about that. Small stint, was that right aid? Worst job I ever had in my life. You can ask me about that later if you would like. So left Friday, um, last year of college, worked at Sports Authority as a merchandiser. So there I worked in a warehouse and I thought, you know what, I should move into supply chain that will make connection with my business background, economics, I really like this. So as many of you maybe are seniors and looking at applying for jobs now, I thought to myself, okay, what is my previous experience? What can I move into quickly? So at the time I had applied for a couple jobs and this came from going to career fairs here at CSUB. Um, so I applied at what's called Rain For Rent. Um, anybody know Rain For Rent or have driven down the 99 Coy North? We have talked yes. about Rain For Rent in this class. It's, oh, a, okay. it's a favorite of the students. Okay, you can ask me about Rain For Rent. Um, so I applied there simultaneously. I, I applied at Ikea um, out of the Lebec Distribution Center. So in my mind, I thought, okay, I was a merchandiser, warehousing, I can apply for these kinds of jobs because I have a little bit of background. I'm gonna, it's a stretch, but I'm gonna try. Um, so this was really when I started to practice a lot of interviewing and I did a lot of research for myself um, on how to prep for interviews. So 
if um, you guys are looking for ways to do that, it's I definitely recommend is reach out to your professors, reach out to people like me to find out what are we looking for, you know, what are some of the tips. So that's the stuff that I did. I was fortunate enough to have business cards from some of the career fairs I went to, and there was this guy at Ring Rent that he seemed really, really friendly, and I took him up on his word and I said, "Hey, you said if I if I have any questions, I can ask you." So you know, I got some information from him, and slowly I started interviewing for Ring Rent. This was for a warehouse supervisor job at the time. The coordinator calls, says I'm going to have an interview on Thursday. Days pass. I, I don't know who I'm meeting with. I don't know the time. I don't know anything. So I call the day before, only to find out they filled the job. Imagine how my heart felt. Oh. I was like, oh. Here I was so excited and prepping and had did all these questions. And you know, I thought, this is just another thing going on. Got finals. Not, I don't have a job. And you know, it's really kind of a stressful time as a senior. Um, simultaneously, I got interviewed with IKEA, two over the phone, one in person. The IKEA interview went, if you guys have ever seen memes about IKEA, it's like, here's this chair, build it, that's your interview. It's kid you not, it really is kind of like that. <laughs> so I interviewed with the HR manager. I thought I prepped as much as I could, but after that interview, I knew I bombed. I bombed, and I, so I was really, really upset. He asked me questions about you know, if I knew who the owners were for IKEA, where are they based, did I know that everything comes from IKEA in terms of they grow the trees that is then used for the furniture that goes into the stores and all vertically integrated. So I was like, do I have the interview? Ugh. What am I gonna do, right? So Rain Frank calls me back. Fortunately, I was able to get a job with them after kind of telling that recruiter my story, he said, what if you come work for me? I have I don't have any experience in HR. He's like, why do you sell yourself short? At you know at Panda Express, you got the interview with the guy the first time because you put yourself out there and you were genuine. I did my research. I got the job at JVX Grill and, and did my customer service skills. I didn't give myself credit for the stuff I was doing beforehand. And it took someone else to tell me then, make me realize like, you know what, like I, I do have some skills that translate. I just wasn't seeing it myself. So um, I went into human resources, first into recruiting. I didn't know anything about recruiting. I just knew, okay, I took one HR class. It taught me drug screening, the basics, and some employment law. I'm out there learning everything on the fly. So fortunately at Rain for Rent, it, it's a nationwide company dealing with uh, water solutions. So um, I was able to recruit people from all over the United States and then Canada and now they're in Germany. So this is all based out of Baker, so I have no idea. But I uh, was fortunate to be mentored by two recruiters who basically taught me everything I knew. From there, I never had to apply for a job again. I just was able to make connections. So when I went to Wonderful Citrus, which was formerly known as Paramount Citrus, um, I got the job there because I made relationships with staffing agencies and they referred me to the director there, interviewed, got the job. I was there for three years. HR manager at Wonderful Orchard saw me at a career fair, pulled me to a side and said, why don't you come work for me? I, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. I really don't need to move or find a change. But over time, he convinced me, and so that's where I'm at now. So were you at the fair recruiting? I was. Okay. I was. Um, so he, I was at Cal Poly Pomona. He was at the booth next to me. There was um, Foster Farms was right next door to us, and I had asked him if he would take a picture of me dancing in one of those hot dogs with the hole in the face. <laughs> so uh, and I, I guess I realized that if I'm myself, that's that's how I've been able to get so far. You know, he was able to see that she's being genuine. When I talk about the company, I like to believe I'm being genuine. That I love working where I work. I love doing what I love to do. You know, so I think that takes you a long way. So uh, that's how we got to this point. I'll talk a little bit about wonderful orchards because I got to do that. It's wonderful. I got to convince you guys to come work for us. 
So, let's see. So, wonderful word trends. Again, sorry, I'm kind of sweaty. Um, we were acquisitioned in 1986. We basically grow all of the crops for the two products, this wonderful pistachios and almonds and palm wonderful. We're the largest nut grower um, within the United States, actually. It's the world, really. We were at 90,000 acres. It's slowly going to transition to 80,000 acres. There was an article that was published last week about that, and that's just due to the drought and water availability for our acreage. So right now it's about 9,000 acres of pomegranates, 40,000 pistachios, 46,000 um, or almonds. And almonds are it's a very good crop to grow because there's very little waste. So anything that, um, for almonds, the, the shells go to like uh, pig farmers who use it to ground up for the food that they eat. Then we use almond milk, there's almond milk. You know, there's almond kind of like everything nowadays. So we actually get um, a lot of value out of that. We have about 800 year round employees plus seasonal employees. We're actually just talking about that in terms of staffing for the upcoming harvest. So it's going to be a pretty big year for us. This talks towards what that harvest looks like. So you see how it's a very small period of time between pistachios, pomegranates, and almonds. So we have people that are working 14, 16 hour days. So how does that affect HR? Well, we're out in the field supporting the employees. So as you see, I'm not dressed in a business suit. I'm wearing my pumas and I'm wearing a polo shirt, but that's because I was in the so I carry a backpack. Um, I need to be able to speak to the employees at their level. And I need to be able to connect with them. So I am an HR professional, but I may not be dressed as one today. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, this is you know, a picture of them out in the field. Any questions about the company at all? Yes. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so I hadn't, before I moved to Kern County, I had nothing to do with agriculture. I grew up in Indiana, but that doesn't mind me. I didn't know anything about corn. Mm -hmm. I, I, knew, I knew nothing about the agricultural business before moving here. And I, I'm having a lot of fun learning about it now. Mm -hmm. And I never realized that that is the, uh, the like harvest season. Mm -hmm. So now that I see that, it actually reminds me a lot of my ex-wife's family business. Uh -huh. Like they, they, uh, um, they decorate shopping malls for Christmas all over North America. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a similar staffing pattern. Like, mm -hmm. they, they hire like 2,000 temps mm -hmm. to put up and take down the projects around Christmas time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they have sort of a steady state of about 200 full time staff. Mm -hmm. So, is that the numbers you mentioned before, the, the 400, what, 800? Um, it's about 800 <laughs> full time, but then temporary employees, it's 400, 800. So in this green area here, yeah. is that where the like temps are, are yeah. coming in? So uh -huh. in white, you've got like 800 staff, right? Yeah. What's going on when it's not harvest time? I'm curious. So the people that we do keep full time are prepping for harvest. So as of right now, it's the almond bloom. Everybody's out taking Instagram pictures out in the crop with the flowers and everything. So you know when it's the almond bloom, we're prepping for it. There's not a lot that. Um, we can do because we don't want to stress the trees. So the more you stress the trees, that affects the quality and the yield. That goes for citrus too. So when I was with Wonderful Citrus, I learned a lot about um, the citrus varieties, which they grow lemons, uh, valencias, navel oranges, mandarins, which is two different types of um, varieties, which is wonderful halos, probably what you guys are accustomed to knowing. Um, ruby red grapefruit that is in Texas and citrus has about 4,000 employees. Yeah. So, very, very large companies. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's just interesting to understand how the logistics of the things work. Cool. Yeah. So, in Kern mm -hmm. County, the, some of the large industries that you would get into are oil and gas, agriculture, healthcare. Um, as seniors, I would recommend that you guys, as much as possible, try to understand what the industry trends are. That's where the business side of things comes. Is you know we try to to budget for this kind of stuff. So I'm in HR, but I need to be able to show analytics. Like, okay, this is how many people we hired last year. This is the time of year. 
How many people didn't make it through the process? How many people did make it through the process? How much does it cost for everybody to come on board? So the stuff that you're doing now will apply when you move into more of the corporate field, the corporate realm. It's just in a, in a different way. You have to be able to understand how to adapt what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about wonderful orchards or wonderful citrus or anything wonderful? <laughs> So a lot of your guys' questions are, what do, what do I look for when I'm recruiting? Um, most people will give, if you look on the internet, it's gonna, gonna be like teamwork, communication, yeah, good computer skills, yada, yada, yada. So I wanted to give you an idea of more so, beyond that, what do I look for? These two have, um, I put in here again for my IKEA interview, because it really was like, oh, I opened the door, okay, I didn't, I didn't expect this, so. You know, self-confidence, what's your biggest flaw? I'm too awesome. It's very true. People come in with a little bit too much arrogance sometimes, where what are your three areas of improvement? Well, I work too hard, and I just don't know when to quit. We all work too hard. but And I understand where you're going with that, but it's how do we transform what we're saying in a different way? As a hiring manager, we yeah, right, you work too hard. I've been here since 4 a.m. and it's 4 p.m. now, so, you know. How I would probably rephrase that is, you know, I spend a lot of time at work and sometimes I lack in other areas of my life, like my personal life, so it's finding a balance of what is good for myself. I think that's a good answer, because it comes from the heart. It's honest, it's genuine, so. Um, integrity, again, going towards being genuine. You want to admit your faults, you know your strengths, and you want to help others get there. So we are a team. At the end of the day, the company is, is not gonna be successful just based off of the work of one person. You know, it's, a, it's a complete team environment. Let's see. We're all trying to get at one point or another further our career, but it's about the team and the company as a whole. So employment is a relationship. Um, passion for the industry, passion for the role. So there are a lot of people like just right now desperate for jobs and employment rate is still not as high as it was several years ago, but it's even harder coming out of college trying to find a career in the corporate world. So showing that you have a passion for the industry, a passion for the role when you're interviewing versus you know, sounding kind of desperate is very, very important. And good communication. So articulate what you want, know that what you're trying to say to the other person is coming across. Sometimes when you're interviewing, you just get nervous and you know, what you're, you may not understand what they're trying to ask you or what you think you said isn't coming across correctly. So it's always good to just pause, take a moment, and then rethink about what you want to say. No one's gonna fault you for taking five seconds to just reprocess the situation. Very good, okay. So I chose a couple of questions that I felt were kind of uh, standouts to me. There was one question on here that I was stressing about all weekend, so I'll wait for that one last. So uh, Christian Duarte. Duarte. And Actually, uh, Christian's not here, but it's a good reason. Okay. Christian, uh, Christian's a really good soccer player. He's, uh, he's a mid he was a midfield fielder on our soccer team, uh -huh. and Christian actually um, is up in Portland, like on a contract with the Portland Timbers uh -huh. right now. So it's a good question. He would normally be sitting right there uh -huh. between Christian uh, Iniguez and uh, uh, Julian Cesar, but. He's not here right now. So oh, well, he, was, go, he was gonna go win this Tahoe Joe's steak dinner. Oh. Now you guys can give him a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know that. But he, he, he would have wanted to be here, but he's yeah. you know, he's got a chance to play for a soccer. So no, I, mean, I can't fault him on that. <laughs> he's in our group, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me think about it. <laughs> so his question was, what kind of business problems have you encountered during your career? Um, so I was going to ask him for further clarification on that, uh, but business problems, 
we deal with business problems all the time. In the corporate world, we're always trying to find ways to better use technology to our advantage, improve or shorten a process, um, or reduce the amount of money we spend. So it's, it's usually around those three things. Um, so some of the business problems that I've helped to work on and improve was definitely reducing our time to fill. So time to fill a position on average, industry is about 30 days. So how, who has ever applied for a job and started a job in 30 days? Okay, so very few, right? Nor, that's what the industry standard is. But typically, you post a job, about three weeks pass, applicants apply, then there's interviews. Then if the hiring manager is decisive, they may or may not make the decision, but it's, so the most I've seen it go is about 90, 95 days. That's three months. So as an applicant, imagine you applied, and then three months later, you got the job. How frustrating is that? And so it's sometimes difficult as the business to remember that there's another person on the other side do this waiting game. We may lose the person, and the amount of time it takes to get someone into that job, trained, it's costing the, the company more than double their salary. So that's one of the business solutions we were able to implement. We reduced it from about 80 days to 61 days, which each day is a good amount of money saved. So over time, it was supposed to be a tiered method. Um, so that was one of the business solutions that I could say that has saved the company quite a bit of money. Another thing we're working on right now which I'll show you guys, um, is we're implementing drug screen testing. So it's one of the nice things I'm carrying in my backpack right now. Um, we did, for drug testing, saliva testing, which we have a swab, we swab your mouth, we're able to tell if you're on drugs immediately. Um, each test costs about $36, and if we're hiring that many seasonal employees, $36 times 800 employees. That's a big chunk of money. So we're starting to implement um, these rapid cups. So this is a brand new one. I was opening saved just for you guys. And one of these is now about $12 to process. So we've saved the company 50% um, for testing. So this is what a drug screen will look like now for everybody. So I was in the field training some people to learn how to take the exams um, or be collectors for the exam. So again, the, right now it's March, so we're prepping for that period in time that's gonna be July. So we have about a month to get everybody um, trained and get the process implemented. So that's something we're currently doing right now. Yeah. Do you use alcohol? We do do alcohol. What's the percentage that they have to do that? Um, like, you know how some of the truck yeah, so we, um, we're not federally regulated, but we do follow the DOT standards, so that's correct. Oh, so that's mm -hmm. So we do a breathalyzer test. Um, this, most of this is out in the field, so as you can imagine, a lot of this has to be portable. Mm -hmm. So again, um, for alcohol testing, you have a couple of different types of tests you can do. Mm -hmm. Good question. Anybody else about testing, drug testing? No? Doesn't seem like a fun topic, but you get this is one of my favorite, which is some people try to give you all of the every answer to the sign on why they don't pass. I was in a vehicle with somebody else. I have a prescription. It's from Mexico. Sure, you have a prescription from Mexico, right? So um, those that's one of the first things I learned how to do was uh, in my first week I had to call somebody and tell them. They failed the drug screen and they didn't get the job. So that was. Fun. Yes. I, I assume your full-time employees have to manage work, but what's like the benefit of having your seasonal employees take that and invest that much money into it? Is the turnover for those employees is a lot higher? Well, so the turnover for seasonal employees is it's expected turnover, but our seasonal employees are driving our farming equipment, and as you hear a lot on the news there's accidents out in the orchards all the time. So it's a precaution that we take um, in order to help 
reduce the amount of incidents we have with the vehicles out in the field. Yeah. So, you know, if you were ever caught in, um, I would say, like any type of lawsuit or arbitration where you know, somebody was driving out um, near the orchard and our employee hit them and there was um, you know, injury or even death, that would be one of the things they would ask us. Did they, they always do a test after an accident of uh, a drug screen and alcohol test. If they test positive, they'll say, well, what was their first test? And if we never did it, that's harmful to them to the company. So HR's position is always to try to minimize risk mm -hmm. for the company. So, good question. What if people do have a prescription? Um, is so there like a box to fill out and give you like their official prescription form? <laughs> so if people have, officially do have a prescription, because I'm a, not a medical review officer, they tell me, I go, okay, that's great, but we're gonna have our MRO that we contract out called National Toxicology do the questionnaire for the employee. Because again, we want to try to take ourselves away from making the determination. So if somebody does have a prescription of any sort, the MRO is gonna tell us. Yes. So you still test everyone like, even though they have the prescription say they have it like oh yeah. So era so um, an example I'll give you if you guys were all employees, the different types of drug testing we do is a pre employment, so you would have all been tested to get hired. If you had an accident, you would be tested. We also do random testing, which is a pool of employees. They just pull a random amount of employees based off of your employee number, um, and you may be sent to go do a drug screen too. So, and then there's reasonable suspicion that if you're out in the field and the manager smells alcohol on you or you show symptoms of being under the influence, they may send you for testing. It's, um, I believe, quarterly. It's definitely not monthly. Oil and gas companies typically do the monthly, and that's because they're federal contractors. Um, the difference between being a federally contracted company versus not being one is if your company provides services to um, the government or any type of uh, government entity. Any other questions about drug screens or testing? <laughs> <No>? <laughs> Just don't do it, guys. <laughs> just say, just say no. <laughs> yeah, it costs the company a lot of money, but you know, even some if some companies have programs that even help you with substance abuse, uh, in that they will provide you to go to counseling if you go to the employer first. If you get the test and you go, well, I have a problem. I want to go. I want to go through counseling. It's not going to work that way. You have to tell us before. You do the testing. So not all companies do that, but a lot of them do. Okay. Vanessa Marie Gonzalez. Okay, awesome. So you asked what is the best and worst part about your job. Um, best part about my job is obviously giving people jobs. Like, I love that part of it. You know, when I'm able to meet the expectations of when somebody's interviewing, I usually am up. I'm very, I try to be a straight shooter. I'm a woman at work. So if I tell you that the job is gonna be within the range of fifteen to eighteen dollars, I'm gonna do my best to get it within there. I ask you what you want in terms of compensation, what are you looking for in terms of growth, and try to do the best match for yourself, the company, and the manager. So I kind of think of myself as a matchmaker because sometimes I do have to tell the manager, like, okay, at the end of the day you just gotta marry the person. You know, they're not gonna be a hundred percent my husband doesn't do the dishes, then I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know? But I had to make the best choice possible. Um, so in a lot of ways, recruiting is like that. So to see that a relationship has worked and has progressed in either promotions or growth within the company upward, that's, that's something that I really enjoy. Um, the worst part about my job is that when some people they didn't get the job. Um, if they didn't get the job out of fault of their own, like they were on drugs and didn't tell me, that makes me more upset than being you know, disappointed. But disappointed in that, it just didn't work out, they got another offer, or what have you. They just weren't able to start. That is probably the worst part about my job. And then of course, filing 
documentation filing. You have to have all your ducks in a row in case something happens, but it's a necessary evil for HR. So, yeah. Does that kind of answer your question? Mm-hmm. Okay, Brett Kettler. Oh, awesome. What's the most difficult aspect of human resources? So the majority of my career has been in recruiting, but more recently I've been doing more of HR generalist duties. Um, but I would say the most difficult thing about HR is your first time that you have to let someone go. It's probably the worst. And you'll never forget your first time either. And my first time, um, unfortunately, didn't go as smoothly as it could have. Um, so it was a learning process. And basically it was more due to performance. Um, it's a lot easier to let someone go when they have plainly disregarded, you know, they did a violation of company policy, they decided to steal. That's black and white. Performance is not black and white all the time. And the best a company can do is communicate to their employees on how they're not meeting your expectations and giving them ways on how they can improve. Um, companies find themselves in trouble when, you know, out of the blue, they just let someone go and they're a protected class, such as you know, they're, they're, they're a diverse member of the organization, they're older generation, they're a veteran, they're disabled, something along those lines. So uh, that's where you have to be careful. That's where companies find themselves in trouble. You know, fortunately, the person that had to let go didn't meet any of that criteria and she knew about the performance issues she had, but that doesn't make it any any easier. And especially if you see them kind of within the same circles doing similar type of activities that you do, you just try to be professional about it. It's just business at the end of the day. I would say that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. um, Eloy Lopez, it's hard to fire a friend that needs to be fired. So that kind of goes to that. She wasn't my friend, but um, you generally are a very personal, full person at work and try to maintain good relationships. So um, it is difficult, but at the end of the day, you're, it's just business. So I generally don't hire very good friends to work with me, and I just know from perspective that it's not going to work out. Same way, I wouldn't hire my family either. They're great, but I just, I don't see myself being able to um, separate that. And so that's, you try to do the best you can for that. Yes. Do you often have family and friends asking you? Do I often have family and friends asking I think they've learned now at first. Yeah, I was gonna put another picture up here if you guys ever seen those memes like, what my family thinks that I do, what my friends <laughs> think I do, what I do what society thinks I do. So um, in the beginning, my family did think that I just was able to hire anybody. Like, oh yeah, okay. I have plenty of jobs for everybody. Um, but over time, through trial and error, I would say, that they know not to ask me anymore. So again, it just becomes more so of a relationship building within the community is how I'm able to, you know, recruit people for the company. So I do things like this, or I go to um, career fairs, I go to different activities like the Young Farmers and Ranchers Association, which we do bass crawls and stuff. And so I try to do more of those types of things to recruit people into the company. So if you ask my friends, they think that I just go out and eat dinner all the time with people. But I'm, it's business, okay? They just, they, they just don't see it that way. <laughs> Does it say bass? Crawl, yeah. Like going from one best restaurant to the next in town? Yeah. Cool. I haven't heard that phrase before. Yeah. Um, California Women in Agriculture, Bass Crawl's coming up in April. So if any females, um, they won't discriminate to males either if you guys want to go. But it's the California Women in Agriculture doing a Bass Crawl. So. When is it? It's in April. <laughs> You're the only guy. <laughs> what? You're the only guy there. But it's good to know about. I might be remembering to tell you guys again. Yeah. 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 Okay, actually, um, 
the Women in Agriculture will be meeting on March 8th with Dr. Aaron in the um, exact location to be provided at a future date. But it'll be from 6 to 7 next Tuesday. And it's the California Women in Agriculture. They're having a to that's talk not, about not that's not when the bass crop. No, but they're going to talk about <laughs> the bass crop. Okay. Um, I was just sharing in case anybody wanted to be a part of the. Got it. And it's, it's with Aaron. Yes. Okay, cool. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so, talking about relationships, <laughs> Abigail Mao. Ma okay. So you asked, what are some ways to develop meaningful relationships with your company that will benefit you in the long term? Um, so similar to just putting yourself out there for those types of activities, um, I have eaten lunch just with people at random too. So if you have like a community lunch room, it's good to go in there. You might have a tendency to be like, oh, I just want to get out of the office, but that's how you're going to find people in other departments to connect with you because sometimes HR has the the stereotype of being hatchet carriers, which means that we just terminate people all the time or we're like the bad guys or you don't want to get a call from HR, but I'm the fun part of HR. You want to get a call from me so I'm trying to hire people for you or I'm trying to hire you. So that's my mm -hmm. cell line. I was like, oh, okay. So my recommendation would be, yeah, go to lunchrooms learn about what other people do, if at all possible. You know, ask your supervisor if they would be open to you to shadow somebody else in, the, in another department or go out into the field. You know, I go out into the field and people ask me like, why are you here? Because you're HR, why don't you be in the office? Well, I didn't understand the big picture of the business. I understand what you do. Yeah, it's not my job to drive a shaker, but I should know how to do one because if I'm hiring people to do that, and you'll be able to explain it and not just, you know, BS my way through it, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yesenia Salado. Salado, right there. Okay. So you asked what has been the hardest decision you have had to take as a senior in charge journalist. Um, sometimes in HR, you know information before other people in the company know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had to go to our Florida location, um, which does wonderful bees. They do beekeeping for um, the company, and they mass produce honey. So the, we had purchased this company and all the employees. So some of the employees were not complying to what new, new policy was because they were a mom and pop, and they were used to doing things their way. So I went to the office and. It was a little shack, basically. I was like, okay, where's the office? It's this couch right here, and then if you, if you need private space, there's a kitchen table right there. <laughs> I was like, okay, so where's the women's restroom? Oh, uh, we don't have one. It's just the men's restroom. Well, then I go, it's, it's completely dirty. There's no toilet paper or, like, anything. So, okay, I can make do, right? But are there females working here? Yes. Okay, so where, where do they go? Well, they, on their lunch, they go home. Okay, so we're not providing good facilities for them, and there's not a working space for them, and so there's just a lot of things that I noted that was not going well. Um, and the manager there shows up late. He came in. He sat on the couch. He just opened up his laptop. He crossed his legs and he was just there. He's like, "Yeah, if you need anything, just let me know." Okay, this is the perception you as a manager are giving to your 100 employees that are out in 90 degree heat, beekeeping in a beekeeping outfit that can reach temperatures up to 100 degrees. Meanwhile, you're inside of an office cooling down, working whenever you feel like. That's not gonna fly. <laughs> so, so that was a conversation I had to have with him um, in that you know, you're being a representative of the company. If, you do not improve upon this, we're going to have further conversation. Um, the following day, we had credit card. Um, we use company P cards for different purchases. So he didn't see a problem with purchasing um, like 
food for himself and like drinks on the company card in addition to like stuff he bought for Home Depot. So I try to communicate to him, like you need to buy your own food with your own money, not just because you have a company credit card means that you can put it on the card. It's like, why? But I'm on my lunch. Like when I'm going to Home Depot, buy the stuff for the company. That's not how it works. So, <laughs> so I knew what was gonna happen next. And I tried my hardest to help him improve upon his performance. And so a couple weeks later, I had to backfill his job. So sometimes it's, it's just, that's the hardest part about it. It's like when you're trying so hard to help someone help themselves, it's just not going well. Like I said, it's easy for me when it's black and white. If you violate the policy, that's it. Like, you knew better, I told you from the beginning, you know, too bad, so sad. But if people are not performing, it's it's not black and white. So it's more of the gray area. So I would say that's one of the hardest, toughest things to do is trying to get your point across so people understand. Mm -hmm. so did you say this was a basically a family apiary that you guys bought? Was the employee in question a former family member? No. Friend of the family? No, he was just a long-term employee. Wow. Beekeepers are very hard to come by. Beekeepers are either in Hawaii, which if I lived in Hawaii, I would move either. Um, Florida, uh, North Carolina, North Dakota. And North bees, Dakota? Yeah. So bees, so bees go migrate in a circle, right? Because um, once they're done pollinating one crop, they have to get out because it might affect how the crop grows. So we own 20,000 hives or so that we rent to different farmers that go across the nation. So they just finished pollination here, that's why you saw all the flowers, so then we'll send them off somewhere else. So his job was to grow the amount of hives that we have, um, and he had been a beekeeper for many, many years, but he, he was, if he was, if he was happy, he was happy just growing bees, but he had the management aspect to his job that he just was not performing to. Stuff. But I have the new guy starting on Thursday. Oh, because so. it's just recently happened? Yes. Oh, wow. So, yeah, his replacement is starting on Thursday. So. Yeah, okay. Hmm. <laughs> I'm just thinking about it. Like, it's, it's a real thing that happened that just happened recently. So, um, What's the hardest situation you had to deal with as a recruiter from Molina? Melina would be sitting there normally. Yeah. She was here before, she? Yeah. Oh, she, yeah, she actually told me she, uh, she had to leave about 20 minutes early to go pick up a family member that had other appointment, so she was here. Okay. We could tell her. Okay. Well, actually, I don't know if any of you guys Good did with, uh, with, with Angel, the mock interviews and the um, career Every, advising. Everyone interviewed. Did. Did. Oh, okay. So I did it with her, so okay. she, she already knows. She's on your good yeah, side, so. Yeah. So she's fine. But her question was, what is the hardest situation you had to deal with as a recruiter? Um, sometimes we have to work with third parties. This connects to another question that somebody had, which was like how my job is structured. Um, so I get, I'm a salaried employee. Recruiters are different based upon whether they're <coughs> corporate or in the staffing world. So some of you guys have seen like Apple One or um, Staff Plus or whatever, right? Yeah, Robert Half. So, my, you guys remember my Robert Half stories? <laughs> so, Monica knows Robert Half really well, really well I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So, there's two different types of recruiting. You can recruit with the staffing agency or you'd be a corporate recruiter. Staffing agency is typically where you would be either paid hourly or salary, plus you get commission on different placements that you get. And placements is whenever you uh, place someone in a job slot. Um, in corporate recruiting, um, it's a salaried and then same structure for the other positions. So I get salary and a bonus based on company performance, individual performance, and departmental performance. Um, I've had experience kind of in both. I've never been in the staffing agency myself, but I work with a lot of them all the time. So um, sometimes it's difficult to maneuver um, because at the end of the day, the staffing agency 
if they don't place a job, they might not get their bonus or they might not even get paid. So I understand the stress that they may have in trying to place a position. I'm with the company as a recruiter trying to save the company money by filling it ourselves versus using a third party. Third party fees can range from 20 to 35% of the new hire's salary. So if I hire somebody at $100,000 and it's 20% that I have to pay to that company, how much is that? Huh? Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's $20,000 that I have to pay to this third party for one person. So imagine if they fill four jobs, 24, 60, 80. $80,000 for four people placed at $100,000 versus just paying me an annual salary to fill 30 jobs. So I'm saving the company a lot more money, but I have to be able to show that I can fill the jobs. So um, probably my, most of my jobs are that I fill are between $55,000 a year to $90,000 a year base. Um, the highest position I ever filled was the VP of IT, which was six figures, about 200 or so. So imagine if I if I charge 20% on somebody who is getting $200,000, that would have been a pretty good Christmas for me, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's like I like more of the stability, security, um, flexibility with working in within corporate or recruiting. So that's. The hardest part is maneuvering between when I'm going to use a third party and when are we going to fill in house because it's costing. It could make a difference of twenty to forty thousand dollars to the company. So, yeah. Just to give you a heads up, mm -hmm. we've got about four minutes left okay. in class, so um, I want to make sure. Like, yeah, those are my last questions that I highlighted. So, can I? Have can it? I like? Well, actually, before I bring up one last one that I wanted to make sure to, to ask, does anybody else have a question that wasn't answered? Yeah. Brianna? Are you here to prepare Wednesday? On Wednesday? No, I'll be at the um, Growing Opportunities Career Fair, um, which I believe is in a week or two weeks. Oh. Yeah. This week, my week looks like I'm here. Tomorrow, I start at 7, two hours of training for... Um, people who want to learn Spanish, and then in the, I'll be at Lost Hills for another two hours for people who want to learn English. Uh, Wednesday at UC Merced, Thursday at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, Friday doing a speech composition at BC. So somebody else asked me if I travel a lot or if I'm in the office a lot. Um, at Rain for Rent, I traveled throughout the United States um, three weeks out of the month. So I was one week home three weeks. Out. Then at Wonderful Citrus, it was quarterly based upon career fairs. So I would go to Texas every three months and then throughout California. And then now I just do more so um, within the Central Valley. That's more of a personal choice I made because I got married recently and I was thinking, okay, if I want a dog, I need to be around the house a little bit more. So <laughs> that's the responsibility, right? So um, that was more of a personal choice for me, but recruitment definitely offers you the opportunity to travel a lot if you would like to. Other questions that didn't we didn't get to yet? Anyone? I'm gonna I'm gonna end with one that uh, I think it'd be useful for the students to hear. And uh, Mutaz actually isn't here right now, but it's a good question that I, I think is different than anything you've mentioned so far. Mm -hmm. He asked, uh, which which one is better, having long time experience in a low level position or short amount of experience in a higher level position? And I think it's relevant for a lot of people here because they're, you know, they're kind of at the beginning of their careers. And, you know, you could you could have just a couple of months doing something more high powered, mm -hmm. you could have four years as a barista. You know, right. uh, can you talk a little bit about like what, how those two things look on the resume as you're hiring people? Yeah, um, and then to give you an idea, so these are all from one career fair. So if I do five career fairs, this is how many resumes I have to look for to fill like five jobs. So if you can imagine, the competition is very stiff nowadays. Um, so for question about whether it matters on, you know, good experience within a three to four month time frame to tenure um, within like a retail or 
establishment, it really depends on what job you're applying for. So if your goal is to immediately get into an accounting role um, out of college, you should have the three-year, three-month internship experience with Brown and Armstrong, because that's what they would expect you to do. That would look more valuable than being a barista for four years. If you are applying for a management trainee position, they're going to want to see your tenure more than anything else. So I think it really depends on what you're applying for. Personally, I like to see more tenure. If you did a job for three months, three months, three months, three months, three months, my assumption is you're only going to do three months, three months, three months again. So it's like, what are you really looking for? So I'm going to look. I'm going to look for if you do have three months of experience. They should be all within the same type of um, industry or type of thing that you're doing. So if you were a babysitter for three months, then you worked at retail, then you decided you're going to be a sign flipper, and then work at the car wash. What does this person really want to do? They want to be outside? Do they want to be inside? Do they want to be in the office? They want to... So um, your resume is telling the story, and it needs to be concurrent. So I guess that's my best answer for that. Anything else? This last uh, last questions while Ren and Monica still standing in front of us? Yeah, business cards. I do have business cards. Would you like one? Yes. Okay. So, let, like, anybody that wants to grab a business card, swing past. Otherwise, I don't want to hold you any longer because I know we're past 5 o'clock now. So, let's give Monica a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much.